Hi, and welcome to The Scoop. Today I've got Chris Sanano with me, a serial entrepreneur and currently managing director of Access Kenya here in Nairobi. Chris, it's great to have you with me, man. Thanks for being on the show. So, Chris, how old are you? It depends. But anyway, 40. <laughs> you look a lot younger than 40, but I read somewhere that you're going to retire in five years, and I would love to know how you're going to do that. Well, and why you're going to do that as well. I feel that at 45, I'd have given enough to the corporate world and I'd like to retire to do things that I really excite me and get my juices flowing. I don't have a boring job. I've been in technology since 96. Um, I work 16 hours a day. And that's mm. some of the reason mm. I need to retire at 45 because I feel I've really pushed myself and I need to slow down. Slow down means get involved in motivational talking, get involved in entrepreneurship, get involved in community service, get involved in, well, attempting to play golf. I don't play golf. <laughs> <laughs> I always say golf is for people about 50 with hundreds of millions. So probably I'll be approaching that. So, but you'll be 45 with hundreds of millions. So, well, so you're not, all right. Not the millions, but I'll be 45. So, <laughs> so Chris, tell me a little bit about your journey. You're Ghanaian yes. by birth. Yes. Um, came here when you were very young. Yes. Um, You've kind of stayed here in Kenya for a, a long time. Uh, is this what you consider home now? Or are, you, are you a Pan-African? For me, Africa is my playground. Mm. Yes, I own a Ghanaian passport, but I'm African, which means I'm comfortable in any country in Africa, specifically. Uh, my dad was a lecturer, so we stayed a lot in different places. Um, his last posting was mm -hmm. Kenya, and that's how I came over. Mm -hmm. I came here. Uh, but I, I consider Kenya home just like I consider Ghana home or um, Johannesburg for that matter. So, so far as I'm in Africa, I'm comfortable. That's and you've been doing, I mean, you, you're, you're with Access Kenya, you've been with, in this IT industry for a long time. Yeah. Um, but your interests really are, you know, you said you're in an exciting job. Yes. But it seems your other interests are much more exciting. You're in, into entertainment, you're into, into you own clubs, you, you're, you invest in clubs, in, in, in the music industry, um, in, and as you said, in different countries now. Where does your heart really lie? I mean, what, what do you really enjoy doing? I enjoy seeing uh, an entrepreneur move an idea into a, an organization or a company and grow it. That's where my heart is. That, what I call the second creation, because I believe everything is created first time mentally, and then second time, secondly, physically. Mm -hmm. So the first creation is mentally. Someone has an idea. The second creation is where I get involved, take that idea and have it executed to fact that to a point that becomes a real business or it becomes a real entity. When I see the joy or the excitement in the entrepreneur, when they've been able to take it to the next level, that's really where my excitement comes from. How many times have you failed? Loads of times. Um, and do you believe, sorry, do you believe in the expression of failing forward? Oh, 100%. In fact, I believe in failing forward fast. <laughs> I, I, I never heard that. The second, the oh, three Fs. The faster you fail, the faster you learn the lessons, the faster you can go back, dust the code, and get onto it again. I failed numerous times. I, if I were to calculate, specifically, I do most of my my currency, I say, is time. It's not really money. Mm -hmm. I believe time and money is the same coin, different side. Mm -hmm. And if I were to calculate how much time I've invested in startups which are failures, it's been fantastic. But that has been my, those, that's the bedrock of my lessons. That's the bedrock. That's where my excitement comes from. Because I know I've been there before and I've failed. I know how not to do it. And I believe learning how not to mm. is very critical in learning how to. Are there certain fields where you wouldn't go back to because you failed so badly or you just left a bad taste in your mouth doing those certain fields? Not necessarily. I got my fingers heavily burnt in software, but I'd go back to software. I mm. just go back with a different mentality, a different approach and a totally different way of investing in it. What advice would you give to young entrepreneurs I mean, in terms of fields? What, what are the... Where do you see the growth in the next 20 years on this continent in terms of fields of expertise? Africa is burning. Forget about it rising. It's rising and it's burning. It's hot. This is the hottest. And be it education, be it service industry mm. in general is, is growing. But all the different sectors, I mean, agriculture. I mean, okay, they say to, to young people, don't talk about agriculture. Talk about agribusiness. Mm -hmm. Agribusiness mm -hmm. is growing. Mm -hmm. 
I know it may not look the sexiest and the coolest thing, but it's growing. Be it from the retail end, the wholesale end, the farm end, it's hot. Education. Education is, I mean, because most of the content is now digitally available, mm. it's an issue of creating the environment or the opportunities for people to come and learn. So the, the opportunities are vast. But when you talk about things like agriculture, for example, I mean, it's not easy for anyone to become a farmer, mm. but it is because you need a certain level of, of, of expertise. You need to have been trained or you need to have been brought up in that particular environment. But the, for me, I see the value in, in adding value to the product. You know, you, you get a cup of, um, you get an export of coffee out of, uh, or a, a kilo of coffee out of Ethiopia. Yes. One of the, the finest coffee in the world. Yes. They're getting it for 50 cents, 75 cents for a kilo. Uh, Starbucks, by the time it hits their, their, their cafe, exactly. It's $10, 10 a cup, a cup of coffee, right? We are not benefiting. As Africans, we don't benefit from that. How do we change that? I guess this is the kind of things that you're looking at. So I'm involved in a project now where for many of years, the only chocolate producing factory in Ghana was the, has been the, the, the government's own mm -hmm. cocoa processing factory. And they just do the same old thing every year in and out. If you go to Ghana, you see people selling on the road Golden Tree, which is the brand they have. Now, it doesn't take rocket science to come up with another brand to not only compete with them, mm -hmm. but also especially for exports. And it's the same, what has happened is that the, 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 the government or the company has done the same old, same old thing all over. Same thing happening every year. So it's about creating a brand, right. creating a niche and saying, no, I'm going to deal with the high end or I'm going to bring something down to the masses. Add value in terms of just branding. Mm -hmm. One basic bit is brand. Second is, of course, processing. You could do it differently. Thirdly is, which other markets can we go for? How is going to... So as opposed to exporting the cocoa as raw material, we start adding value in Ghana and then exporting and or even selling to the local market. Right. So it's basic stuff like that. The same for coffee. Um, there's a lot of coffee that's produced in East Africa that is exported and then repackaged and then brought back in, imported at times 20, times 30, times 100. We can have local brands. We've seen some local brands in terms of coffee houses, mm -hmm. the Javas, the Dormans, and the art cafes coming up, which are doing things not only in Kenya, but also for the region. We are going to, we're moving into the age in the next 10 years, we'll have massively dominant African brands. Just the same way that you have your McDonald's mm -hmm. and your Wimpy's and your um, whatever, Steers, when you go around the, 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 the world, we want to have, or we are going to have, let me put it that way, because with my help, mm -hmm. <laughs> helping entrepreneurs, dominant African brands, that when you fly into any capital of an African city, you'll see, Oh, Salim's. Brands you can recognize. Brands you can recognize. Yeah. And you know, Salim's is a coffee brand that comes originally from Kenya, but they source stuff from Kenya, Uganda, Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. They blend it, and this is the local brand, or this is an African brand. I like the way Salim sounds. That's, yes. a, that's a brand I'm going to do. <laughs> We're going to talk more about entrepreneurship when we come back after the break. <music> Welcome back. We're still with Chris Sedano, and we were talking about entrepreneurship. But I'm going to take that on to another level now. Very few young Africans, you were talking about retirement earlier on, very few young Africans want to get into, successful young Africans want to get into politics. You've expressed an interest in going into politics at some point. Um, is that really, is that an avenue you want to pursue? Because if you're talking about enabling better entrepreneurship around the continent, one of the things that has to change is the way governments um, interact with entrepreneurs and how they make a business environment more attractive for people to come in. Is that something that you think you could, you could add value to in terms of politics? 100%. I think the, the issue here is that the word politician and the industry of politics, I think, has, has been tainted in Africa. Politician means guy with big stomach who's done some funny deal somewhere and gotten rich overnight. I'm not looking at getting rich overnight. I'm not looking at getting rich. I believe I'll be wealthy, mm. but that's through hard work, and that's why I'm putting in the time mm. now. I feel politics is about influencing people, processes, and systems to get what you want out of it for the betterment of society. It's not dirty. Mm. And until young Africans start to step up to the plate and say, I'm going to make a difference, I'm going to make a change, then we're all going to either sit down in the pubs, drink, beer and complain about what hasn't happened 
I'm not that type of person. I'm an action person. So I'd rather get involved where I know I can make a difference. And so that's what it is about me. But it's not an easy profession to get. It's not an easy field to get into. I mean, a lot of reasons that young leaders, uh, very young, successful Africans don't get into politics is because they're scared. They're also, in, in Africa, it's a life-threatening profession as well. If you start stepping on the wrong people's toes, the fat cats that have been having their own way for so long and you guys try and come in and, uh, and change things around for the betterment of a society rather than the individuals, um, there is a chance that you could, you could actually lose your life. What is the life worth living if it's not worth losing for something you believe in? That's the way I look at it. You know, what is it all about? What's the legacy I'm going to leave? A legacy has to be family as well. And, yes. and at, and at some point you have to, that, that is a thought that crosses many people's minds. Do I want to put my family in danger if I get into this particular field? I mean, you have two young kids, uh, six, six and five, six and five. Is this continent going to be someplace where you want to see them grow up? I want them to feel proud that they're African. I want them to feel confident that this continent has everything that they want, they need, they can dream of to make them excited to want to live here. When I was growing up, most people wanted to go to primary school, high school, and then go to college off in the US or UK and stay. Why did they want to stay? Because everything that they saw in Ghana or in Kenya was anything good that they saw was attributable to something that was important. Mm. That's got to stop. Now, they will grow up into a different Africa. And we're just saying that we want to make sure that even the business environment, the political environment is great enough for them to want to be here. Going back to you have businesses in multiple African countries. You, you invest in multiple African countries. Most Africans find it harder to, to work within Africa than they do working in, with the U.S. or with Europe. And that's one of the... The, the, the movement of, of, of both resources, uh, to people, technology within Africa, is, there's so many boundaries that are not there, which is why many move out and, and, and make their fortunes elsewhere. So I believe that we need to start from the basic units. The units are people. Mm. When people don't know each other, they can't do business together. I, I have a, an interesting acronym, FUNDS, F-U-N-D-S. I once met an old actually an Indian gentleman who's African, an Indian, mm. of Indian origin, who told me, Chris, you guys want to make dollars, DS, but you don't realize that before you make the dollar, you need to create the fun. It's about me and you sitting down and getting to know each other, having some fun together or laughing. Mm -hmm. it's, the humor, it's the human interaction that's going to help us to move that into business. That's also what's going to create the platform for, for politics. You, we have to remember that at the end of the day, people don't want to influence things just because they want to influence it. They want to influence things because there's a business, there's an mm. angle to it, there's a factor to it. It depends on the stakeholder, whether it's the, the stakeholder, in this case, the government or the citizen. So in terms of Africa or Pan-Africanism, I believe that we need to open up the borders. We need to get people to first know who's on the next side of the border, get to be their friends, and then they'll get to trade, and then they'll get mm. to do bigger business. And we, as a, the, the, the citizens of this continent called Africa, it, it's about the basic unit like a passport. It then moves on to our government's understanding of creating the commerces, I mean, the, the, sorry, the free trade areas, so that people can trade and mm. get to know each other. And the worrying thing is, though, we've, we're now seeing almost a, a new colonial power emerging on this continent in the form of China. Yes. Um, and it seems that every government is running to embrace them and to get their hand into the cookie jar um, of, of Chinese uh, uh, money. Where does, this, where does this put us in the future? As Africans trying to make a living on this continent, now we have to compete not only with others, other Europeans, Americans, now we've got the Chinese as well. We always seem to be going sort of one step forward and five steps back. I think this time maybe we're getting it right in some angles. There's a lot of movement to send our kids to learn Chinese Mandarin. Mm. Why? Because the people they're going to be trading with, or the people they're going to be doing business with, or schooling with, there's going to be loads of Chinese. There's already loads of Chinese on the continent. It's not going to stop. It's not going to reduce. It's going to go more. Mm. And maybe we miss the opportunity to learn our own languages, and so, or have common languages on the continent so that we can have 
come and have common values and common culture, that's gone. Maybe it's by having to compete now with Europeans, Americans, and Chinese, it will put us to a totally different level of competition and make us actually much better Africans. And maybe that's what's going to force us to trade with each other. Maybe that's what's going to force us to say, hold on a minute, let me take a step back. Instead of investing in the UK or out of the continent, let me go to Zambia, let me go to Zimbabwe. Because these are growing markets and maybe I'll be more accepted. So you actually think that this could be something that would unite us a lot more, having that, this, this sort of common purpose of not wanting to get um, pillaged, what, uh, for lack of a better, better word, than as we were in the past. Yes. At the end of the day, people sometimes, most often are not come together when they can see a common friend mm. or a, a common enemy or a common purpose. In this case, it's purpose. So I believe that Hmm. That there's a big enough cost. The, the, I think the issue of Chinese invasion or European invasion, American invasion, it's there. We're seeing it. We're living with it. And hmm. we have to step up and do something and do about something. it. Yeah, positive. We'll be right back with Chris Sonano. Hi, we're back with Chris Sonano. We were talking in the break about heroes and role models, Chris. You mentioned two very interesting people. Tell me who your role models were, or are. Mandela and Donald Trump, actually. Now, you couldn't get two more diverse people than that. <laughs> One was a man of the people, the other is a man of power and money. Um, that's an in Why those two? Well, I guess maybe that tells you a bit about me. Um, I had the chance of meeting Mandela, actually, in 95. Um, and it was... I mean, he's just that type of a guy. You meet him and you, it's not an, only about the presence, but mm. you, I don't know how to put it. It's just this piece uh, about him. I understand. Calm, I understand. Body. I met him a couple of times yeah. and, uh, and it, it's a, it's a, I'll never forget the experience ever. Exactly. So, Donald Trump? Donald Trump because I guess he represents entrepreneurship, capitalism, and I think all leadership and management books will tell you the one thing that a lot of managers or chief executives fail to do is to fire people when they should. Mm. It's the most, one of the most difficult things. And as much as Donald makes it look very easy, I know it's not easy for him either, but he makes the one point he makes is that you've got to be ready mm. to do what it takes to make the ship survive, even if it means sometimes sacrificing. And also having bad hair. That yes, really helps. There's a whole, <laughs> there's a whole bit of bad hair. Good thing is, you don't have that I problem. Have none, have you don't none, have that have problem at all. About, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Biggest challenges you will see in the continent over the next five, ten years. You know, you said when you retire, you want to do more motivational speaking, more um, entrepreneurship, um, uh, being more of a mentor to, to young entrepreneurs. Do you find that there is challenges with uh, young people coming out of schools and universities today that have a sense of perhaps entitlement. entitlement. Um, they haven't really worked that hard, but they feel that they already deserve what many others have been working very hard for. Do, do you see that as a problem going forward? It, it, there is a mentality, there is an attitude of entitlement. I call it, I, I think it's about being in the microwave generation. You get out of college and zap, they feel if you plug it into the microwave, press five minutes, mm. you're CEO of a big conglomerate. It's partially due to a lot of what's happening around them, that everything is much, much faster. It, when you were in high school, I'm sure you had to write a proper manual love letter to whoever you're interested in, have mm. it posted. Mm -hmm. If possible, it got delivered and hey presto, the lady wrote back. But right now with WhatsApp, mm. BBM, Mm. You can, you, th that message is transmitted within seconds. And so they're used to microwave love, mm. microwave um, success, microwave this and that. And so what we might look at as entitlement is just, but I expected to be CEO mm. 10 months after graduating. And so it's, that's where the mentorship is also very important, that people with brilliant, young minds with brilliant ideas and brilliant potential may not necessarily have the patience that is necessary to move their ideas to the level that they could have. That's where you and I come in to add that value. That, that is important. And 
we can get away that sense of entitlement by mentoring these young, brilliant mm. minds. Chris, any regrets in life if you could be given the chance to do the, like, the last 40 years over again? <coughs> What would you change before you <laughs> before you start? See, as soon as I said regrets, you started coughing. Yeah, you almost choked, man. Um, no, not so, really. No regrets, or what would you do differently? Well, for one, I'd have my kids earlier. I got married pretty early, 27, but I we were on a honeymoon for five years before thinking about kids. So I, that's one thing. I'd I'd have my kids earlier because I think growing up with your kids is always it's an exciting thing. Mm. So I love them. Mm. I mean, I'm having fun being in their life now, but I, I, that's just one thing. That and it's a time when you were really busy, as you said, so you haven't been able to spend exactly. as much time as you like. And these are the early years. I mean, I have girls that are um, 18 and, and 16, yeah. you know, and, and they are, um, you know, I've grown up with them. Yeah. And fortunately, they still want to hang out with me, but that's yeah. not going to last much longer. <laughs> but you're right, it is something yeah. that you miss. Um, I missed a lot of that growing up, yeah. early phases because of, of, of the travel and stuff that I... Yeah. I was doing, but I, I, so that's one of your big regrets. That, that's, that's one of it. Number two is, um, I think there's this notion and it probably comes with the whole import mentality that having a, a master's or an MBA is a very critical stage mm. or step. A lot of Africans mm. are spending family fortunes on going out of the continent to get mm. uh, master's degrees. I mean, as an employer, now, I mean, you run your own companies, a number of different companies. Yeah. When you get a CV, I, I, I mean, maybe everyone's not like me and I need to find that out. Yeah. Do you really look at their educational qualification? I mean, someone sent you a project that they've done or a showreel of their work. Is that something that interests you more than whether they went to Warwick or Yale One, or Harvard? 100%. Or? So apprenticeship is backing. I, I will take, I, I hire attitude. Let's mm. start from there. Mm. And that comes from whether you did agriculture, education, mathematics. I mean, sometimes people put combinations together and you wonder whether they want to become a magician anyway. <laughs> so it, it, to be frank and honest, I, the only bit of education that matters, and, and this is coming from, my, my dad went to Oxford and, and to Yale. And to, to be very frank, and sorry, Cambridge and mm. to Yale. To be very frank and honest with you, we have arguments about the whole education mm. stuff in Africa. I can and, see and that I would be an interesting argument. Point blank to him. This academic staff is only good for up to a certain level. I want to be comfortable and confident that the people I'm hiring have the ability to read and to communicate properly. Over and above that, attitude mm. is what matters. You'd rather spend five to seven years getting yourself well-groomed in a specific industry that you're excited and passionate about mm. than going off to spend your family fortunes on a master's. No, no disrespect to people who spend big money to go to Harvard, Yale, and Warwick, and wherever. But I'm just saying that's it's on the side. It's not something as an it's employee not, you look at. It's not exciting. No, yeah. I want a great attitude, and I want somebody who's exposed. Yeah. I want somebody who's going to come, hit the ground running, if possible, or hit the ground and get running faster because they are able to read, write, and they're able to communicate. Social skills, interactive skills, is ten times more. EQ is more in than IQ. Having a 10 IQ, <laughs> emotional, I like that phrase. EQ yeah. is, is so in, IQ. Speaking of exposure, Chris, this is the scoop. Yes. So now you've got to give me something <laughs> that I can share with our viewers, something that people don't know about Chris Sanani. I'm very shy. That's not, I mean, that, <laughs> that's, that's not going to work. It's not going to cut that's it, man. That's not going to cut it, Chris. Let's take a break. When we come back after <laughs> coffee, we'll get the scoop. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be right back. Hi, we're back with Chris and Anna, who, before the break, decided to take over my side and take us to the break. So, Chris, you're not going to get out of it that easily. Give me the scoop. Okay. If I were not in technology, if I were not doing all the things I would doing, I'd actually be in theater. I'd be on, a, on an acting stage and probably doing Shakespeare or something like that. A lot of people don't know that part of me, that uh, actually I was very excited about the arts in high school, both in primary school and high school. And um, interestingly, my report card always used to say, if only he could put the amount of attention and energy in the curricula like he does in extracurricular. Mm -hmm. And I want to say to all those teachers out there who wrote that, the extracurricular sometimes is 10 times more important than the curricula. Good. 
<laughs> Chris and Anna, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure having you. Thank you very much thank for being so with much. us. Thank you all for joining me on The Scoop this week. Stay tuned for next week. We'll have yet another great African personality. For me and the entire team of The Scoop from Nairobi, Kenya, have a great week. <laughs>